Well, good morning. Good to see everybody and welcome to our hometown, Memphis, Tennessee. I've got my colleague Alan Barrett here and uh, David Shoves in the other room. And uh, we certainly appreciate uh, that uh, you all came here. And uh, it's real exciting. And, uh, you know, that introduction, it just reminds me how good of a job my mom did. So she really wrote a long, good one there. Uh, and I'll try not to swear. I did grow up around Longshoremen you know, on the West Coast. Uh, I learned a lot of language, but I swear I will not swear with you all this morning. So, again, thank you for having me here today. Uh, following on the heels of the presentation we just had and looking at uh, the picture around trade and, and policy and such, I'm going to hit a few comments around that. I want to give a bit of a macro perspective as we work with a number of our clients worldwide on a, on a daily basis. And every day we're communicating with about 325 various clients in one form or another. Uh, our clients span uh, the globe in the area of commodities, products, uh, end users, whether they're in finance, transportation, policy, uh, manufacturing, production, uh, uh, input sectors. There's a wide sector of uh, clients that we're engaging with on an ongoing and active basis. And, and today, let's just say that there's so much going on in the big picture around economics. Uh, today, we, we got uh, some earnings coming out from Caterpillar, one of our bellwether uh, economic indicators, and it's not pretty. Uh, if don't look at your phones now and look at your 401ks. It's too late to change them. Uh, but we, then, we, of course, we got the whole thing around trade and policy that, quite frankly, that's the first conversation we have with our clients now. And in, in relation to China, and we'll talk briefly about that, we'll go into infrastructure requirements. It's been asked um, by Tim Phelps, and thanks, Tim, for uh, the great conversation leading up to this event. Uh, Looking at infrastructure and transportation and what that means, what are some of the shortcomings, what are some of the opportunities? Uh, we like to remind people, you're, as much as you're producing, uh, processing, manufacturing, packaging, selling uh, different types of wood products and commodities, you're not sell, that's not what you're selling. You're selling freight, you're trading freight. At the end of the day, it's all about the competitiveness that you have in the marketplace to compete with your neighbors or with a neighbor around the world and to access the marketplace there. So we'll talk about uh, those requirements and opportunities and in infrastructure. Briefly hit on rail and on the barge market and then talk about some container developments. And there's a real exciting project that we've been engaged on. And for those of you that will be on a Port of Memphis tour tomorrow, certainly encourage you to ask the executive director, Randy Richardson, about this particular project that I'll highlight because it's, it's a very new and exciting opportunity that we look at coming down the road. And then just briefly look at a South American experience of what we see from a competitive pressure that's impacting you, the U.S. today and, and, and as well as at the same time with what we see going on on the policy front. I'm going to hit just a couple of these key points here. I think the number one, the trade disputes by far and large, as I said, are the top bill that we get with our client visits. And as we talk with about commodities, whether it's in coal or in energy or in uh, livestock, grains in particular, oil seeds especially, and specifically soybeans, that's the one we get a lot of discussion around. What is this going to mean for our U.S. soybean market? Where is China going to really get all their soybeans? Bottom line is China can get by not buying any soybeans from the United States for the next six months. They can, one, with plenty of supplies that they have on hand. Two, they can just sweep every bin, every field in South America and get by to be able to supply what they need for their economy. Three, that Brazil's going to have a, they're planting really fast with a lot of acres in South America, and they're going to be harvesting very early in January uh, 2019. They're going to be able to feed that pipeline into China very well and very succinctly. F fourthly, China is slowing down its consumption of soybean meal in particular for its livestock sector. And so they're finding ways. And as they slow it down, they're also substituting, fifthly, another feedstock into their livestock sector. Just got back from Tokyo and Indonesia, uh, uh, Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia here. Uh, and the, those two, had two trips to Asia in the last six we uh, four weeks. And that, again, as they look in those markets, they're all finding new products to send to, a to China to substitute into their feeding ration to get by. China's looking at this as an opportunity to try to go after President Trump, 
go after middle America and say to the U.S. farmer, who by and large was one that really supported the president when he became president, says, we got you, we're going to get you. Well, that's not necessarily true. Now, in the meanwhile, the U.S. farmer is going to be amassing mountains, and I mean mountains of soybeans like we've never, ever seen in this country. We're going to be stockpiling them anywhere that we can stuff with uh, soybeans in this, in this economy today. And we're going to see some depressed prices on soybeans. But here's the kicker. The U.S. farmer, for the time being, has got the president's back. When Alan and I or David show, if we go out and visit with some of our producer clients or the producer associations, the commodity associations, we hear over and over again. I think this is very important for us. The farmer says, we get it, we got it. China has been, and this is their words, screwing us for too long. And we've got to find a way to try to bring them back into parity, especially on intellectual property rights and what they've been doing to this. For too long has China been coming after the United States and the rest of the Western world, quite frankly, on a lot of the, the regulations and the way that they conduct business in China. And certainly they've done that. And they've got a centralized economy that is very well oiled and very well machined. They can just flip the switch if they want to stop seeing commodities come into China. As it is, we've got about six vessels of soybeans going to China right now. And four of them are sitting outside ports in China for weeks waiting to get in. They could go in very closely to under the 25% tariff, plus the freight, plus everything else to get in that country. Except for one thing. China's got to issue them an import permit, and they're not doing it. So you're seeing these gamemanship going on in China, trying to stick it to the president through the U.S. farmer. And for the time being, the U.S. farmer is not only standing his ground, but he's also got $12 billion that the administration has promised. And certainly about $8 billion of that will be going to the farmers in some sort of direct payment as they harvest their crops. There's already money going out to the farmers as they harvest today. A buck $1.65 a bushel on 50% of the farmer's production today for just for soybeans, let alone pork and corn and cotton. There is some benefits out there as we look out there. So that's a very important topic as we look at these trade flows because if we don't see any kind of resolution here, quite frankly, we could see a devastation to U.S. agriculture that could go on for years if we don't see some sort of resolution as we look at these mountain of soybeans that will sit here in the United States. We ex have exported over half of our soybeans and two thirds of that went to China. And we're keeping back uh, over one fourth of our harvest this year that's gonna sit on the ground most of the year waiting for a market to go to. That could be very devastating to US agriculture as we go forward here. And that could have major implications on policy, on farm bill, and other implications that we look through there. And we, those are some things from a policy standpoint that got to be looked at. Meanwhile, when we look at the world, though, the world is just growing still, especially going to Southeast Asia. I was with some folks down in Malaysia and Singapore last week. And to say that they're uh, uh, not expanding is under uh, a statement. They are growing phenomenally with a rising middle class and certainly changing consumer uh, patterns of what they buy. Having breakfast with a gentleman who has put together dozens of deals in Southeast Asia on M&A activity, and we've worked with him on several of them. They're seeing consumers who, are, especially the young, who are uh, walking away from his history and tradition and religion to eat pork, to eat beef in countries that would normally not eat that or religions that would uh, look down upon that. And they're saying, look, I've got money, I've got freedom, and I like the taste of good food. Who doesn't like bacon, right? <laughs> one of, our, bacon, one of our, our, our pork analysts actually suggested that there's seasonality to bacon. I can't believe there's seasonality. I think it's 12 months of seasonality at one level. <laughs> How many of you had bacon this morning, right? <laughs> think about that. Well, globally, we're seeing that we've got a lot of volume of a lot of commodities. There's a lot of people who've come in. High prices do one thing. They bring other people to the market who think they can produce and be efficient at it. There's no one more efficient than the United States producer, United States producer forester, uh, a logger, others. There's no one more productive than what we can do here, except that we've got a lot of competition who's come out there. However, 
if we don't keep up with our infrastructure, if we don't keep up with our transportation, that's where we find our competitiveness start to slip. And so monitoring and watching that competitiveness on all fronts, not just at the price at the gate, not just at the price at the port, it's also getting it to the port, it's getting it to the market position and saying, where are we missing out on? Where are we falling behind? Now, we haven't heard much from the president in several months about talking about infrastructure. Wait until November 7th and let's see if we talk about infrastructure. He was interviewed on one of the news channels here about two weeks ago. And they asked him, well, President uh, Trump, what, what happens if you lose uh, the, the house? And he said, well, look, we lose the house, we'll get along, we find ways to work together. Look, we both like infrastructure. And so here's the president saying, we've been holding off infrastructure planning until we get to the midterms and let's see where we go. If we have, win the house as Republicans, Boom, we go forward. If we lose as Republicans, we can go to the Democrats. We have something to offer them, and we can get some momentum. Case in point, the Water Resource Development Act was just passed two weeks ago, 99 to 1 in the Senate. When was the last time the Senate actually got together, 99 to 1? And who was that one? It was a Republican senator out in Utah. <laughs> so you look at some of these things. You're looking to the strengths that you have. We've had a very quiet talk from the administration for months about infrastructure. But after the election, I think we'll start to see things change there. Meanwhile, again, that consumer is continuing to grow, uh, uh, consume. They're not giving up. They're getting more money in their pockets. There's a big, giant export market waiting to buy our goods and our services from the United States here. Uh, lastly, there's a number of mergers and acquisitions going on in the uh, global economy. They have not stopped, and they're going to continue to go forward. And I, we can tell you from the banks that come to us, the private equity groups and other major companies, they're looking for people to gobble up and to consume and make more efficient as they go forward here. Um, looking at um, what's going on in transportation, we're moving more freight in the United States than we've ever moved in history. We're moving at phenomenal levels, whether it's on rail or by truck. How many of you sit behind a truck that has a sign on the very back door that says, looking for good drivers? <laughs> for a good opportunity 53 feet ahead, call this number. Almost every single truck is looking for some sort of driver. We, are, we can't find enough employees in this country. Every client I go to, and I'm sure if we spoke to each one of you in this room, you too can't find enough employees to keep them on if they can get through the drug test, if they can get through the common sense test, and then make it into the front door. We are all struggling finding enough employees to be able to fulfill the requirements that we have. Meanwhile, that's leading to ne new technology leading to opportunities for uh, automation and ar using artificial intelligence in a number of multiple ways. But when you look at transportation, we're moving more than we have in history. Now, if you break this down further, one key aspect to this is our energy front. We have seen the pipelines explode, and a large growth here is about moving crude oil and also natural gas and moving those into further market positions. And certainly, we become a phenomenal uh, e exporter of crude oil as well as natural gas. And again, China has uh, been b backing off and buying from the United States. But meanwhile, we are selling elsewhere around the world the things that we're pulling out of the ground. The United States is still a great resource country, and the world needs the products and the commodities that we have. Now, meanwhile, in the United States, as much as you see trucks on the road, you also see drivers everywhere. We are driving more miles in this economy than we've ever driven before. However, it looks like we might be peaking out here. And this has a lot to say about a number of things. Number one, if you take a, a trend line and run right through those miles driven, that's what would be called the budget line for the highway trust fund. And look at that gap we had from 2007 to just recently. We have been falling behind in funding necessary uh, investment funds to be able to improve our infrastructure. And we've certainly fallen behind on that front. And secondly, you look at this, how many more miles we're driving is also more fuel consumption, gasoline, diesel. It also means something when we look at it from a corn situation, how much ethanol is required to be penetrated into the gasoline markets. Now, meanwhile, we have tipped the, the, uh, the peak on how old our vehicle fleet is 18 months ago. And every new car we buy today, pardon me, every new SUV and pickup we buy today, because we're not buying cars, we're buying SUVs and F-150s, we can't get enough of those. The fuel economy is better than the previous generation. But nonetheless, I don't hear many people buying electric cars today. 
Now, here recently we've seen gasoline prices start to bump up, and maybe we start to see that. The, but meanwhile, the consumer says, look, uh, I'm not in any kind of uh, uh, recession because, um, well, I'm not depressed, one, because I'm working, and I'm not in a recession because I'm not re there's any recession because the neighbor's working. Back in 2007, neighbors were not working, and when you were not working, you were depressed. That was a depression is when you weren't working. And so we've got a full employment in this economy, and people are not so worried about $2.50, $3, $4 a gallon gas, depending where you live in this economy. But it's starting to hit home here as we go forward. Now, and meanwhile, if you look at ocean freight rates, guys try to be a bellwether of what's going on in the econ economy, especially for uh, crude oil, uh, for uh, uh, bulk uh, iron ore, coal, uh, grains, minerals, salt, fertilizers. We've seen these freight rates on the very far right of this chart, forget that big hump in the middle, start to try to creep back up here. And a lot of it's associated with uh, grains in particular, but coal has been running very strong, especially out of the United States as we move forward here. And looking at the types of commodities that are moving, we're seeing some resurgence in some of these commodities. And that just shows what's going on globally for some economic vitality. The United States economy has been lifting really all boats around the world here and has been very beneficial. But meanwhile, when we look at this, we've got a big picture of very solid economic activity, uh, but yet we've got this competitive situation in the world that the United States has been looking to us. If you look at the Panama Canal, for example, and we've looked at this several times on multiple fronts, both for the Panama, Panama Canal Authority, several uh, associations and organizations, and get a sense of what's what the impact would mean for United States, we can certainly see by adding a third set of locks down there is very, very beneficial. But what we've seen is we went and uh, uh, visited and had a briefing with the canal here in June. The canal, the new set of locks is not at full capacity. They still have about six or seven new uh, uh, slots available. They've seen very large and, and mainly uh, con new container ships coming through there as well as LPG ships going from Houston, Lake Charles, uh, New Orleans, and going all the way over to Asia with uh, transformed uh, natural gas to help energize other economies elsewhere in the world. And so you're seeing a lot of these ships going through there as well as Roro ships, very, very large ships. What that's done is opened up the old set of locks with more capacity for other ships to go through there. So the whole effort around the Panama Canal has been important because it led to about every single port on the East Coast and the U.S. Gulf to want to dredge to 50 feet of water to accommodate the capability to go through the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal will allow for a 50 foot uh, uh, draft, that's the amount of, uh, that the vessel is sink below the water line. Up until 2016, it was only 39 and a half feet that could go through there. And what we have shown is that you could really go from say 70 mile draw area in the United States along the Mississippi River system and you could ex more than double that out to 150 miles and be very competitive because you can just put more volume on one ship and get it into the market position and be very competitive compared to other markets that you would see out there. So very beneficial that we would see from the Panama Canal side. And again, when we look at that and we think about investment opportunities, there's a big push. And we did get an Army Corps of Engineers report that recommends a 50-foot draft now on the lower Mississippi to go from a 45-foot draft to 50-foot draft. And as we looked at this for agriculture in particular, we looked at some bands. And if you look at those red bands, you see some, again, that 70-mile range and you start creeping out. You could get out to almost 200 miles and accrue those cost savings and be competitive that far out for the river system. Infrastructure matters and it matters most. And we can see that when infrastructure improvements are made, people take advantage of it. Take, for example, if you look at the Columbia River system. In 2011, the Army Corps engineers completed a three-foot draft deepening effort of the Columbia River system. And if you look at this chart here, and you go to G uh, uh, about January 2011, and you look at vessel loadings of 55,000 tons or more of grain, start looking at how much more grain's being loaded on those ships, when that draft got deepened, infrastructure was completed. The market saw it and took advantage of it. And not only that, we saw several billions of dollars of investment put into export facilities, new berths, new terminals 
on the Columbia River system to take advantage of this opportunity here. When we make investments, there's opportunity that comes from this. And that's a story that's got to be brought out over and over again because that keeps us competitive in the game that we have out there. And that market, we can see, now they're roughly around 67,000 tons on a ship rather than down there around the 60,000, 57,000 tons. And in some cases, you're getting over 70,000 tons, which is quite impressive to load on a ship. And of course, out in the PNW, I know we're, this is a Southern Ex uh, uh, Forest Products uh, Conference, but they're moving a lot of forest products up there and they're continuing to see some more vessels showing up to serve that industry. And they're seeing the cost benefits being accrued through the system here. Now, in the United States, our infrastructure, if we look at waterways in particular, and if we just go down here about 12 miles to the Mississippi River and you'll see it tomorrow, We've got a very expansive navigation system. Uh, there's some two, uh, uh, 200 sites, 240 locks and chambers out there uh, that help accommodate moving well over uh, a half billion tons of cargo every year through the locks and dams and the uh, navigable waterways of 12,000 miles or so. But about a half, but if you look at some of these locks and dams, you're looking at uh, an aging system that's well over uh, 60 years of age, some that exceed 80 years of age, and they get to be aging really fast and are very vulnerable to failure. And those things, if we look at the railroads, the railroads are investing about $20 billion a year self-funding their capital and their infrastructure. If we were to fix all these locks and dams that are high priority, and get a lot of the projects done that the core and the industry says are important, you only need about $9 billion. $9 billion. And the railroads are spending $20 billion a year. And the, the barge operators, the ship terminals, and the operators, they can't put any more money into the river system because it's tied to the Army Corps of Engineers. And the way that the Congress has said Army Corps engineers will fix and repair and build new projects in the river system. We've got an antiquated system here. This is a chart showing locks up and down the system from Minneapolis, St. Paul, all the way down to St. Louis there at lock 27. Just look at the age of those uh, 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 locks up there. So look at some of those that are jumping over 80 years of age. Many of those have not had much major rehabilitation. And all, most all those locations only have one lock. And they are 600 feet long, and modern locks would be 1,200 feet long and accommodate an entire tow of barges, 1,200 feet long, 15 barges at one time, and that's equivalent of taking 1,100 trucks off the highway. And just think about we start shutting down the system, you put more trucks out there. You think truck freight is difficult today? You wouldn't see anything if we lost a lock on the system out there. It gets to be very tight overnight as we go through there. Now, meanwhile, we are finishing one of the longest standing uh, lifetime projects for some construction people down on the Ohio River. As some of you are very familiar with this. We're seeing the Olmstead Locks and Dam finally completed after 30 some years. First authorized in 1986, and construction started in the 1990s before we really got full, uh, started to get off, uh, uh, appropriations in there, and certainly it has taken far too long for us to get through this process. It was originally estimated to cost three quarters of a billion dollars, ended up costing over three billion dollars. Thank you, taxpayer. Look how much money you wasted on trying to get a project done over 30 years. And there's a lot of story behind that. The good news, it's done. There's still two locks to be removed, Lock 52 upriver, Lock 53 downriver, to make that a very, very efficient location on the river. And it's very important to have it done as we go forward. So projects are getting done, but we're still way behind where they need to be. And certainly with the Congress and the President, there needs to be a big push in there. And there's a lot of great organizations that do that. Now, wrap up here and think about some of these individual modes and then talk about a new uh, container opportunity here. If you look at the railroads, they never uh, uh, dislike a tariff increase that they haven't seen. They keep raising rail rates per car. This is on grain because we get consistent grain freight rates. Look at these rates, and just in October, for example, they just raised them again for corn and soybeans, fairly dramatically. 
And if I just, if you remember what I told you about soybeans, we're not exporting our soybeans to market. And yet, you look at the soybean line, the railroads increased it. And I, we know the same thing. We've done some, uh, 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 some policy work, and we've also done some audits of, for the, uh, some of your industry. And we've gone in and looked at some of your books, opened them up, and said, how well are you getting uh, coverage on your freight rates with the railroads? In many cases, you're not fully loading your cars. Shame on you, actually. On the other hand, the railroads are getting you for thing, stuff that you shouldn't be uh, billed for. And when we look at some of these, these are very expensive charges for you. And there's got to be a better way. And they know they can get away with this because what's the next, next best alternative in most places is truck. How many of you try to go procure truck rate lately? And you've seen double digit increases in truck freight rates year on year. And it gets to be very expensive and the railroads know they can get away with that. Otherwise, the flip side of that is looking at what kind of waterway opportunities do you have and recalibrating your logistics. It's a constant game. If you're undershirking your logistics and transportation department, you better go and, and speak with them. Give them some investment to say, what can we do better? Because we can do better. If we're having to pay much more for freight, how much is this impacting our bottom line when we go through here? Now, meanwhile, the railroads, for all that they're charging you and for all that $20 billion, they're not getting you much more velocity in the system. The trains are not anywhere near the five-year averages. Admittedly, they're running freight at very high volumes, mainly on intermodal traffic. Those are those domestic uh, inter intermodal tra uh, uh, international containers that come in, you know, full of all that stuff that we buy. We consume and then we throw away. And the next Christmas, we start to do, do it all over again. We're a buy and throw away society. So China needs us to be a buy and throw away society. If we think that China thinks they got something on us, they don't, because they're going to get hurt pretty hard not having the biggest market in the world to come to, a disposable market. If you've got, how many of you have got a weed eater? You know, when you run out of line, how many of you like putting new wine in that weed eater? Well, there's a bad audience. You're all pretty self-sufficient. There's other audiences. They just throw that sucker away and go buy a new weed eater. They don't want to mess with that. We're a disposable society, and China knows that, and they play to that game really well. And if we're, not, if we're not buying from them, we're going to have to buy from someone else as we go through here. The railroads understand that too. But look at the performance. You ask yourself, what am I getting for $5,000 a car? What am I getting out of $20 billion investment? Is this the best I can get? There's got to be some better ways as we get. Now, if they're running real slow, that probably means two things. One, weather's bad. Or two, the economy is really good. And the economy is good. There's a lot of freight being moved, as I said earlier. Now, meanwhile, I will say this. The amount of time that trains are spending in a terminal are getting less and less and less. However, however for some of you, you may not be unit train loaders. You may be single train loaders, meaning you're moving less than 100 cars at one time. You're considered a single train mover, a, a, a car mover. And you're going to see your car sit in different places because of different types of rules and such. And the Eastern Railroads have been horrendous. CSX has been trying to clean up their mess from Hunter Harrison trying to do a shock and awe, and they've made some good, good improvements. And then Norfolk Southern is way behind the, the bell curve and trying to keep up with things and by their own admission. Now, they had a couple of big hurricanes, and let's just say when an event comes in, airlines, for the most part, can get back to service in 24 hours. Railroads, it takes weeks for them to get back in service. Now, on the barge market side, we spend a lot of time looking at the barge market. We survey the operators, ask them how many barges they have in operation, an annual proprietary survey uh, that Alan leads, and we put together an information. We actually shrunk the fleet for the first time last year. It's been a while. Certainly on the covered side and on the tank side, the, the open barge side needs to shrink faster. That's what moves coal. We just got too many of those. However, the export market's throwing a head fake and we're not retiring them fast enough. The, open, the covered fleet is still real young. It's going to take three years to get to any period of massive retirements and uh, reduction of that fleet as we go forward here. And right now, uh, Alan has been doing quite a bit of work. And Alan's going to sit on the panel uh, later this morning. I have to catch an airplane. He's going to talk. He may get ask him about the tank barge market. The tank guys are really excited. They're seeing so much oil, so much chemicals, and other products moving on the river system. It's really tying up uh, more towboats and more crew. The, the inland navigation people, just like the railroads, are having a tough time retaining and hiring people. We look at the barge market like we look at any commodity. 
from a fundamental view. This is our supply and demand view just for the covered barge market. I know some of your commodities actually at pulp and some others logs will move on an open barge in some cases and we've got supply and demand tables around those but if you look at this we look at all the commodities moving in a co covered hopper barge whether it's grain, salt, fertilizer, steel, uh, cement, you name it we're looking at it. Same thing on the liquids breaking it down and what we do is we look at let's index the fleet size to 1997 and let's look index the tonnage to 1997 and what you see here is tonnage has been improving fairly uh, credibly for the uh, dry side uh, for the covered fleet and we see that improving more just because of the export markets for grains and commodities well this year with China that's maybe throwing a little head fake we could spend a lot of time talking about what's developing but we see that we take the difference of those two lines and we get a pressure index and we say that the barge fleet should be under more pressure as we go forward here and we should see barge freight rates increase all the more as we go forward and what we've seen is barge freight rates represented on this chart looking at uh, the percent of tariff the way that the industry quotes that and every spot on the river has a fixed tariff rate so from St. Louis it say it's four dollars a short ton to New Orleans and if it's 200 percent of tariff you just double that rate so it's eight dollars a ton and here on the Illinois River you can see that's maintaining a fairly high level except we didn't get the harvest surge because of the soybean market and you can see how the soybeans and these trade disputes do impact certain things now we had weather issues Last year in January, we had a number of, uh, of lock issues at different locations. We had different uh, conditions with a surge in demand that kept those barge freight rates propped up almost all of 2018 coming into now. And right now we're seeing that rates are, despite not hitting the, the peak, they're maintaining a fairly steady level here as we go forward, which has been good for the barge operators. But there's a lot of barge equipment out there, except we've got high water. <laughs> abnormally we usually have low water on the upper rivers this year we got high water and so we're seeing some four locks had been shut down for a while and that kept things uh, uh, propelled a little higher now meanwhile let's flip to the container side and we'll wrap up with uh, South America talk about competitiveness when we look at container markets this is a chart just looking at the generational growth of how big container ships have come if you look at uh, the, the, around the uh, 1,500 container size, that was the first ship I went on was the Anders Maersk in 1980s. Went on that ship, I thought, man, this thing is massive. It's huge. How does this ship stay afloat with all these containers on there? Well, that ship, Anders Maersk, was nothing for what was coming to the market. And today what we see are 13,000, 14,000, 18,000 20-foot equivalent ships showing up in the United States. And now there's vessels that are sailing at 20,000, and there's a ship on order for 24,000 containers. If you bring one of those ships to a port, and you unload all those containers, 20-foot containers, stack them end on end, that will get you halfway from Memphis, no, three-quarters of the way from Memphis to Nashville. That's how many containers are on a ship. And when those ships show up, they need a couple of things. They need a lot of cranes, they need a lot of infrastructure, and they need a lot of labor. Not only just the longshoremen, and quite frankly, the longshoremen situation is changing. They're going to automation. And I can tell you, growing up in a longshore family, they ain't liking this. They're hating this. And I can tell you at Thanksgiving, and we've had a lot of disagreements in my family about what's good for the economy, what's good for the consumer. And of course, the longshoremen thinks they're the only thing that matters. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> This is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> Thankfully, it's only my brother that's living, so he, he knows my debate. When you look at this, the longshoremen realize they've got to buy into automization because they know this is important for us to be competitive. It, they know it on the West Coast it's important for them to be competitive because they're competing with ports in the Gulf and the East Coast. Now, the way the current contracts are structured, on all coasts of the United States, we've got at least labor peace, be it that it is, until 2022 when the next round of contracts come up. Now we've got some individual contracts going on here and there, but those are a little sidebar discussions. But we're having to see a shift here in how we uh, unload ships. Now meanwhile, we've had a lot of mergers and acquisitions of, of the uh, container business. You don't have as many carriers out there today that you had three years ago. Three years ago, Hanjin went bankrupt. And that had a lot of cargo sitting in the water everywhere. And some of you I see are shaking your heads remembering that you probably had cargo on that ship 
probably still got them on ships that are looking for a home out there. And certainly you've got a lot of... Cons now this port right here, this terminal, this is a picture of the first container coming off at this brand new port we took. And this container terminal is not in operation today because OOCL is no longer OOCL. They've been bought by another Chinese company. And, and down in Long Beach, they're debating what's going to become of this several multi-billion dollar terminal. It'll get resolved, mind you. But you've got these different challenges that go on in the system out there today. And you get that consolidation. Of course, consolidation gives you fewer choices. And you've got to look through what are the opportunities that you could have for yourself as you go through the system. Just looking at container ocean freight rates, they're staying fairly steady as we calculate and look at an implied freight rate. They're running around $40 uh, to $60 a metric ton to get from, say, Kansas City to uh, Taiwan today. And that's going through the U.S. West Coast. Now, we've been uh, engaged by a couple of groups to analyze a brand new container on vessel program. Now, some of you may have heard of container on barge, and that's well and good. We've studied the daylights out of that. And that's where you take an existing barge that's non-propelled, it gets pushed alongside to a dock, and you put the containers on there, and then a tow boat comes along and takes it away. We've been asked to look at a new concept that this group, American Patriot Holdings, has put together. And their concept is a self-propelled vessel of two types, one a liner vessel and one a uh, hybrid vessel. Remember I said the first ship I went on was the Anders Maersk 1,500 TEUs? Their liner vessel and their uh, hybrid vessel are much bigger than that uh, Anders Maersk. They're proposing a 2,500 TEU vessel, self-propelled, four uh, um, Z drives, one in each corner, LNG engines, liquid natural gas, that will be plying the inland waterways going from a brand new port that would be built at the Port of Plaquemines uh, um, Parish, just down rivers from New Orleans, and that they would have uh, on the liner service uh, two places that they'll be going, one here in Memphis and then up in St. Louis. And they'd just be going back and forth running these vessels as they go forward. As we're finishing up the final report on this, we thought we had it finalized their engineers came back and said, look, if you look at the exoskeleton, the upper level, it was all designed with steel. They said, you know what, we can use aluminum. Apparently, it's good for the military, and it might be good for the F-150, so they figured it might be good for a, a container vessel. Well, they reduced enough weight to dramatically lower the per unit costs and to make that rate even more compelling if you compare shipping to the U.S. West Coast by rail out of Memphis or St. Louis, or even to the U.S. East Coast, and go down by river to the center gulf, a, a dramatically lower rate. I wish I could tell you the exact amount. I, I can't yet until the final report's done, but I can tell you this much. It's very compelling from where we sit as economists. And we've evaluated a number of programs. Now, that presumes they're going to have fully loaded vessels coming up the river with all the consumable, disposable things that you and I buy, right? And they're going to have products going back out. And they're, con they're in a position to keep looking for more products as they go forward here. And certainly, if we look at the export market and we think about alternatives. Remember I showed you that rail chart earlier? It's true on the intermodal side. Those freight rates keep going up. And that optionality gets to be important. So for the, as this is an export market, a conference, and we start thinking about alternatives that could be available to you, this is one that's very exciting as we've looked at that and has some compelling optionality that would come forward here. There's very credible savings in two areas. One, and by the way, the hybrid vessel, 1,825 TEUs, it's designed to be able to go through any lock. Because when you go through a lock, now you're limited to a nine-foot draft. When you're down river from a locks down in St. Louis, you basically have a great amount of room. You can go 14 feet, 15 feet of drafts. When you go through a lock in a typical dry barge, you lose 15, 20% loading capacity. Well, they've designed a hybrid vessel to accommodate locking rivers and to get into other areas as they, as they develop those markets here. And the, the team that's putting this together all have experience on blue water, brown water, and ports and terminals and operating vessels. And so when we look at some of this here, it's not just the compared cost moves to the U.S. West Coast or the U.S. East Coast, but it's also in total transit time. They're talking, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, 10-day round trip. Plaquemines Port, St. Uh, Louis, seven-day round trip, 
Plaquemines Port, Memphis to make that happen. It's all about velocity, it's all about speed, and having optionality for themselves. And so when we look at this program and we stick with their, their statistics and their data, it gets to be quite a compelling, because when they can uh, realize those types of transit times, and that containers are not gonna be sitting on a dock, like they do on the West Coast, and you look at some of the all water routes to get to Asia, they actually get to be very similar in transit time for the whole transit time compared to by, go rail from the Midwest to the West Coast to Asia. Very fascinating program here. And so tomorrow when you're with Randy Richardson at the Port of Memphis, ask him what uh, the view of the Port of Memphis is about this program and he'll be happy to discuss with you what, how they view it and what they would be initiating or planning to put such a program together. I would say this is probably something that uh, is, is quite exciting compared to a container on barge as we look at the economics and the dynamics around such a program as we go forward here. Lastly, I just want to close up with South America. And if we look at South America here in particular, you've got a situation where if we look just from a grain standpoint, South America has been known to have very poor inland logistics. They've had a lot of challenges to try to move products to the market, but yet when, they, when price is right, they find a way to get it to market and they keep moving more volume to the export market because price is a great fertilizer to get things done, right? And so what we've seen in South America is that they've gone forward into their northern ports from uh, Santarim all the way over to Itaki, uh, into Bacarena and into uh, Belim and other markets. And they have built big modern export facilities, ports and terminals to accommodate trade and exports. It's not just grain, by the way. We took a group down of CEO, of, of board of directors of, an of a group down to Northern Ports to tour these facilities. And at that time in 2015, those ports only had 14 million tons of throughput capacity. Today, that capacity exceeds 60 million tons. And what you're seeing is that they're knocking the socks off from a competitive standpoint against the United States. And we have to be looking at our neighbors and our competitors to see what are they doing. And you gotta take that information and communicate it with those decision makers, those elected officials here in the United States and says, look, if we don't do something with our infrastructure, if we don't stay ahead of the game here, because look, we've got all these commodity flows and it's important for you to know your commodity flows. How are you getting into the market? What are the channels that you're using to get into the market? If you don't understand that, I'll we will tell you this. Your competitors know, and they know what they got to do to access the market here. Because right now, when we look at South America, uh, they're in a position to really take up and do quite a job. So when we wrap these things up here, the global economic environment is conducive for export opportunities as we look at an expanding and growing middle class around the world, especially in Southeast Asia, and of course in China and India especially. U.S. infrastructure is strained. It was the envy of the world. It's just, it's got, it doesn't have wrinkles, folks. And thankfully here in Tennessee, if you go out here uh, uh, a little bit east of here, you'll see a massive uh, bridge project going on, four bridges being replaced. It's very important that we do this infrastructure. But we look across the United States, we're way behind because we don't just have wrinkles, we have broken hips, knee replacements that are taking place here, and we're not keeping pace with that. The railroads are running at high level of service and they're running at high rates. If you look at the inland waterways, there's full of opportunities, just as I characterize, not with only the container and vessel, but even on the other side of uh, dry barges, opens and covers, and even on the tank side to the extent that you may have uh, some co-product that comes out of some of your plants that are liquid oriented. Uh, looking at container and vessel, great opportunities we just mentioned. The global competitors, as we just highlighted, are improving their infrastructure and keeping pace to be competitive in this market. They're knowing that the world wants our stuff. Look, we work with private equity guys. They're looking at dozens of deals every day. And one, one PE firm got it in, in, in about 12 seconds. They said, Ken, no, we get it. We want to invest in the river system. Because, and I said, why? Because the world, we got what the world wants. And we got to move it to them. If a PE person gets it, a Congress person, elected official should get it, right? because it's all about getting stuff to the market here. If you can't move it, someone else is gonna find a way to get it there. And we need to understand these commodity flows and what the competitive pressures out there. And the challenge is, what do those look like? Then what's that economic impact? It's all about jobs. 
It's all about tax revenues and demonstrating that back to local economic development boards, back to government, uh, local governments, state governments, but also to the federally elected officials as we go through here. End of the day, infrastructure does not vote. November 6th, we've been hearing a lot of push for people to go out and vote. The, the question infrastructure is asking, who's going to vote for me today? And now there's no necessarily any direct infrastructure project on the balance sheet or on, on the ballot. But there is a place to start thinking about if we look long run. Remember, infrastructure means concrete and steel and rebar. Those are projects that take not just six months, despite the shovel ready push previously. They take years to get designed and to get built and to get into operation. And we're talking about building things for the future. Well, I appreciate the time. I don't know if we have any time for questions or not, but I appreciate being with you this morning, and I wish you uh, much success the rest of the day.